As many Englishmen discovered the Bible for the first time, they felt the need for the Church of England to reform its ways, to be more like what they found in the New Testament. The vast majority of these religious nonconformists chose to stay within the Church to work for its purity. They were derisively called Puritans. The name stuck. The Puritans were not the only dissenting Christians in the Church of England. There was also a very, very small group of religious nonconformists that thought that reform within the Church of England was hopeless. The difference is that the Puritans were trying to purify the Church of England, which they thought was lax and heretical after the Elizabethan settlement, whereas the pilgrims who would share the Puritans' Calvinistic theology thought there was no point in trying to purify it. What you need to do is separate from it and establish your own church. One specific congregation of the separatists are known today as the Pilgrims. Their name implies that this world is not their ultimate home. They are only passing through. After Elizabeth, King James I ruled England from 1603 to 1625. He was no friend of anybody who deviated from strict conformity to the Church of England, and that included the Pilgrims. I will make them conform, or I will harry them out of the land, or do worse. James's philosophy was, no bishop, no king. He could control his subjects religiously through the means of bishops. Ironically, King James is best known today for the beloved masterpiece that bears his name, the King James Bible, which was first published in 1611. James enrolled more than 50 of England's greatest scholars from Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster to assemble this translation. The only reason that King James even agreed to a new translation of the Bible was to dethrone the Geneva Bible of 1560, which was very popular with the Puritans and the Separatists. The group we know today as the Pilgrims was a particular congregation of Separatists that met in Mid-England, called the East Midlands, in the sleepy village of Scrooby, which is in Nottinghamshire. Scrooby is about 150 miles north of London. These pilgrims began meeting around 1606 in the manor house owned by one of their leaders, Elder William Brewster. William Wrestling Brewster of Plymouth, Massachusetts is the great-grandson by nine generations of Elder William Brewster. William Brewster was the elder of the church. He was, he was you know, one of the you know, founders of, of the church. William Brewster was a remarkable man. He really had a, a great setup in the East Midlands because he had an inherited an important post and, uh, for the government, and he could have stayed there and enjoyed that. But instead, he took his home and turned it into a house church, and he put his heart with the separatists, and he became an elder and a leader. And when it was time to go to America, it was William Brewster who would be the, the key leader in getting them from Holland back to England and over to America. They began their congregation with a concept they found in the Bible, the covenant. A covenant is a formalized, usually religious agreement between parties. It's a promise. That's another word, a way of putting it. God is the witness and it often it is with God. The United States can be said to be the first and to a large extent most Judeo-Christian country in the history of the world. The Pilgrims founded America for all intents and purposes. Their chief pastor was John Robinson, who was a graduate of Cambridge University and a great biblical scholar. The Pilgrims' services were secret and were illegal. Their children helped them by watching to make sure no authorities were coming to arrest them. Uh, they had to do it in secret. They couldn't really publish when they were going to meet. And the teenagers, like William Bradford at the time, were part of the youth group, which were called spies. And they would be outside listening to what people were saying. So if they heard anybody say, hey, we're gonna, they're going to meet here tonight, they would, they would possibly change the time or even the day. The King of England is the supreme authority in matters of religion as well as matters of state. They paid a high price for practicing their faith according to their conscience. 
Pilgrim leader William Bradford would later write about the whole Pilgrim story in his book of Plymouth Plantation. It is well known unto the godly, how ever since the first breaking of the light of the gospel in our honorable nation of England, Satan hath raised, maintained, and continued wars and oppositions against the saints. William Bradford, the opening lines of Plymouth Plantation. Well, Bradford, who came into the separatist movement as a teenager, was there for all the big events. He was there in England, he fled England, he went to Holland, from Holland he came to America. In America, eventually, he became the governor, he became the preeminent leader of the pilgrims at Plymouth Colony, and he also became the great chronicler, the one who really recorded their life and what uh, their hearts and beliefs were. After a few years of anxiety of secret worship, of double church attendance, both in the Church of England so they wouldn't get punished, and then in their own secret congregational meetings, they decided to leave their country. In Holland, they reasoned, at least they would be tolerated. Their first attempt to leave ended in disaster. The ship captain they hired betrayed them and stole their possessions. Many of them ended up in jail. Their second attempt was also disastrous. On May 12, 1608, at the port of Hull on the east coast of England, a group of about 80 of them, men, women, and children, were on board a coal boat called Francis. The 80 passengers were attempting to flee the only country they ever knew, England, in order to find sanctuary in Holland. But they did not have an official license to travel. Well, the separatists wanted to leave England. And in a sense, James I would have been glad to get rid of them, but the problem was, uh, if you were considered a nonconformist, if you weren't uh, conforming to the to the rules of the Church of England and the hierarchy under the king, then you weren't allowed to leave the country. So they were really caught between the rock and the hard place. The coal barge, or bark as it was called, was able to carry the passengers out to sea where they could be transferred to a Dutch ship. Suddenly, the king's armed soldiers came to arrest them. By this time, the poor men already aboard were in great distress for their wives and children left thus to be captured and destitute of help. And for themselves, too, without any clothes but what they had on their backs and scarcely a penny about them, all their possessions being aboard the bark, now seized. What weeping and crying on every side, William Bradford. The authorities kept the women and children they captured in jail for a long time, but it grew to be an embarrassment because their behavior was so um, remarkable and uh, their attitude was so good. Well, the men made their way back and the women and children went home, but they tried again. They were not going to give up. Eventually, they made it over to Holland and within a year settled in the town of Leiden. There, they spent many good years. Being thus settled, after many difficulties, they continued many years in a comfortable condition, enjoying much sweet and delightful society and spiritual comfort in the ways of God, William Bradford. But after about a decade, they became restless. The hard work, the extra hours, the poor jobs, working in a second language, all of this took its toll. But the worst problem was that some of their children were enticed by the worldly Dutch youth and were leaving the church. Another concern for the pilgrims was that the treaty of peace between Spain and Holland was going to expire. What this could mean is that they would lose their religious toleration because Spain could reinvade Holland as it had earlier. When the pilgrims were in Holland for more than 12 years, they realized several things. Actually, the year uh, 1617 was their year of decision. When that time, they realized the truce with Spain was going to end in 1620. Secondarily, they realized that they were getting older. Their children were not walking in their ways the way they wanted to. The temptations of a freer Dutch society were such that they didn't like that. And so they began to consider another move this time to the New World, to America. It was no small decision to decide to go to America. America was this mysterious, dangerous place, a place of, uh, of uh, three-headed snakes, uh, a place they had heard of unicorns, a place where there were saber-toothed tigers, where there were cannibals. 
Those are the stories that were coming back from the early explorers in America. And so it was a very fearful place and it was a very difficult decision to decide that you're going to take your wife and your children and you're going to expose everyone to those kind of dangers in America. But the the great desire to have this freedom of faith drove them to do that. And so when they finally made the decision where to go, they decided they would go to Wilderness America.